if you play this out 10 years, mm -hmm. how do you see people actually interacting with this technology in the near future? Cleo, everything that moves will be robotic someday, and it will be soon. You know, the, the idea that we'll be pushing around a lawnmower is already kind of silly. You know, maybe people do it because because it's fun, but but there's no need to. And and um, uh, every car is going to be robotic. Human or robots, uh, the technology necessary to make it possible uh, is just around the corner. And so everything that moves will be robotic. And they'll they'll learn how to be a robot in omniverse cosmos, and will generate all these plausible, physically plausible futures, and the, the robots will learn from them, and then they'll come into the physical world, and you know it's exactly the same. A future where um, well, you're just surrounded by robots is for certain, and I'm just excited about having my own R2-D2. And of course, R2-D2 wouldn't be quite the can that it is and roll, roll around. It'll be a, you know, R2-D2. <laughs> yeah. It'll probably be a, a different uh, physical embodiment um, but it's always R2, you know, so my R2 is going to go around with me. Sometimes it's in my smart glasses, oh, sometimes it's in my phone, sometimes it's in my PC, um, it's in my car. So R2 is with me all the time, including, you know, when I get home, you know, where I left a, a physical version of R2 and, you know, whatever whatever that version happens to be, you know, we'll, we'll uh, interact with R2. And, and so I, I think the idea that we'll have our own R2-D2 for our entire life and it grows up with us um, that's a certainty now. Yeah. I think a lot of news media, when they talk about futures like this, they focus mm -hmm. on what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. Yeah. There is a lot that could go wrong. Yeah. We should um, talk about what could go wrong so we can I'd keep like, it from, from yes. going wrong. Yeah. That's the approach that yeah. we like to take on yeah, the show yeah. is yeah. what are the big challenges yeah. so that we can overcome them? Yeah. What buckets do you think about when you're worrying about this future? Well, there's, there's a whole bunch of the stuff that everybody talks about bias or toxicity or or just hallucination um, you know speaking with great confidence about something it knows nothing about and as a result we rely on that information um, uh, generating uh, that's a, a version of generating uh, fake information fake fake news or fake images or whatever it is uh, of course impersonation um, it, it does such a good job uh, pretending to be a human it could be it could do an incredibly good job pretending to be a specific human and so, so the the um, uh, the the spectrum of of um, uh, areas that we have to be concerned about uh, is fairly clear, and there's a lot of there's a lot of people who are working on it. There's there's a some of the stuff some of the stuff related to AI safety um, requires deep research and deep deep engineering, and that's simply it wants to do the right thing, it just didn't perform it right, and as a result, hurt somebody. You know, for example. A self-driving car that wants to drive nicely and and drive properly, and just somehow the sensor broke down, or or uh, it did, didn't detect something, or um, you know made it to too aggressive turn, or whatever it is, it did it poorly, it did it wrongly, wrongly, and so that's that's a whole bunch of engineering that has to be done to to make sure that AI safety is upheld by making sure that the product functioned properly, and then and then lastly. You know, whatever what happens if the 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 AI wants to do a good job, but the system failed. Meaning, the AI wanted to stop, um, stop stop something from happening, and it turned out just when it wanted to do it, um, the machine broke down. And so, uh, this is no different than than a, a flight computer inside a plane having three versions of them, and then uh, so there's there's triple redundancy inside the system inside uh, autopilots, and then you have two pilots. And then you have um, uh, uh, air traffic control, and then you have other pilots watching out for these pilots. And so, so the the AI safety systems has to be architected as a community such that such that these AIs uh, one um, uh, work work function function properly. When they don't function properly, they don't put people in harm's way, and that there's sufficiently safety and security systems all around them. Uh, to make sure that that um, uh, we keep AI safe, and so there's the spectrum of conversation is gigantic, and and um, uh, you know we have to take the parts take the parts apart and and build them as engineers. One of the 
incredible things about this moment that we're in right now is that we no longer have a lot of the technological limits that we had in a world of CPUs and sequential processing. And we've unlocked not only a, a new way to do computing, and and but also a way to continue to improve. Parallel processing has a, a different kind of physics to it than the improvements that we were able to make on CPUs. I'm curious, what are the scientific or technological limitations that we face now in the current world that you're thinking a lot about? Well, everything in the end is about how much work you can get done within the limitations of the energy that you have. And so that that's a, that's a physical limit. And uh, the laws of physics uh, about transporting sick information and um, transporting bits, flipping bits and transporting bits, um, at the end of the day, the energy it takes to do that um, limits what we can get done. And the amount of energy that we have limits what we can get done. We're far from having any fundamental limits that keep us from advancing. In the meantime, we seek to build better and more energy efficient computers. This, this little computer, uh, the, the big version of it was uh, $250,000. Yeah, yeah. That's little baby, baby digits, yeah. This is an AI supercomputer. The version that I delivered, this is just a prototype, so it's a mock-up. And so the, the, the very first version was DJX1. I delivered to OpenAI in 2016, and that was $250,000, 10,000 times more power, more energy necessary uh, than this version. And this version has six times more performance. I know, it's incredible. We're in a whole new world. And it's only since 2016. And so eight years later, we've in increased the energy efficiency of computing by 10,000 times. And imagine if we became 10,000 times more energy efficient, or if a car was 10,000 times more energy efficient, or electric light bulb was 10,000 times more energy efficient. Our light bulb would be right now instead of 100 watts, 10,000 times less, producing the same illumination. Yeah, and so, and so the, the energy efficiency of computing, particularly for AI computing that we've been working on, has advanced incredibly. And that's, that's essential because we want to create you know, more intelligent systems and, and we want to use uh, more computation to be smarter. And, and uh, so energy efficiency to do the work is our number one priority. When I was preparing for this interview, I spoke to a lot of my engineering friends, mm -hmm. and this is a question that they really wanted me to ask. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're really speaking to your people here. Mm -hmm. You've shown a value um, of increasing accessibility and abstraction with mm -hmm. CUDA and allowing more people to use more computing power mm -hmm. in all kinds of other ways. As applications of technology get more specific, I'm thinking of transformers in AI, for example. For the audience, a transformer is a very popular, more recent structure of AI that's now used in a huge number of the tools that you've seen. The reason that they're popular is because transformers are structured in a way that helps them pay attention to key bits of information and give much better results. You could build chips that are perfectly suited for just one kind of AI model. But if you do that, then you're making them less able to do other things. So as these specific structures or architectures of AI get more popular, my understanding is there's a debate between how much you place these bets on burning them into the chip or mm -hmm. designing hardware that is very specific to a certain task mm -hmm. versus staying more general. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, how do you make those bets? How do you think mm -hmm. about whether the solution is a car that could go anywhere, or it's really optimizing a train to go from A to B. Mm -hmm. You're making bets with huge stakes, and mm -hmm. I'm curious how you think about that. Yeah, and, and that, that now comes back to um, uh, exactly your question, what are your core beliefs? And, and the, question, the, the core belief, either one, that transformer is the last AI algorithm, AI architecture that any researcher will ever discover again, or that um, transformers is a stepping stone towards uh, evolutions of transformers that are uh, barely recognizable as a transformer uh, years from now. 
and we believe the latter. And the reason for that is because um, you just have to go back in history and ask yourself in the world of, of uh, computer algorithms, in the world of software, in the world of, of um, uh, uh, engineering and innovation, has one idea stayed along that long? And the answer is no. And so that's the, that's kind of the beauty. That's, that's in fact the essential beauty of a computer that it's able to do something today that no one even imagined possible 10 years ago. And if you would have, if you were to turn that computer 10 years ago into a microwave, then why would the applications keep coming? And so we believe, we believe in the, in the, in the richness of innovation and the richness of invention. And we want to create an architecture that let inventors and innovators and software programmers and AI researchers swim in the soup and come up with some amazing ideas. Look at transformers. The, the fundamental characteristic of a transformer is this idea called a tension mechanism. And it basically says the transformer is going to understand the meaning and the relevance of every single word with every other word. So if you had 10 words, it has to figure out the uh, relationship across 10 of them. But if you have 100,000 words, or if your context is now as large as read a PDF and that con read a whole bunch of PDFs, and the context window is now like a million tokens, the processing all of it across all of it is just impossible. And so the way you solve that problem is there are all kinds of new ideas and flash attention or hierarchical attention or you know, all, all the wave attention I just re read about the other day, um, the number of different types of attention mechanisms that have been invented since the transformer is quite extraordinary. And so, so I, I think that that's going to continue and, um, we believe it's going to continue and that, that computer science hasn't ended and that AI research have not all given up and, uh, we haven't given up anyhow. And, and, uh, and that, that having a computer that enables the 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 flexibility of of research and innovation and and um, new ideas is fundamentally the most important thing one of the things that i am just so curious about you design the chips there are companies that assemble the chips there are companies that design hardware to make it possible to work at nanometer scale when you're designing tools like this how do you think about design in the context of what's physically possible right now to make? What are the things that you're thinking about with sort of pushing that limit today? Um, the way we do it is even though, even though we have things made, like for example, our chips are made by TSMC. Um, even though we have them made by TSMC, we assume that we need to have the deep expertise that TSMC has. And so we have people in our company who are incredibly good at semiconductor physics. So that we have a feeling for, we have an intuition for what are the limits of, of, of what today's semiconductor physics can do. And then we work very closely with them to discover the limits because we're trying to push the limits. And so we'll discover the limits together. Now we do the same thing in system engineering and cooling systems. It turns out plumbing is really important to us because of local cooling and maybe fans are really important to us because of air cooling and we're trying to design these fans in a way almost like you know they're aerodynamically sound so that we could pass the highest volume of air make the least amount of noise. So we have aerodynamics engineers in our in our company and, and so even though even though we don't make them uh, we design them and we have the ex deep expertise of knowing how to have them made. And and, um, and and from that, we, we, uh, we try to push the limits. One of the themes of this conversation is that you are a person who makes big bets on the future. And time and time again, you've been right about those bets. We've talked about GPUs. We've talked about CUDA. We've talked about bets you've made in AI. Self-driving cars, and we're going to be right on robotics, and... This is my question. Yeah, we're what are be, the bets we're be that right you're on making Omniverse. now? The latest bet, of course, we just described at the CES, and I'm very, very proud of it, and I'm, and I'm very excited about it, is the fusion of Omniverse and Cosmos so that we have this new type of generative world generation system, this multiverse generation system. I, I think that's going to be profoundly important in the future of, of uh, robotics and physical systems. 
of course, the work that we're doing with human or robots, developing the tooling systems and the training systems and um, the human demonstration systems and all, all of this stuff that, that you've already mentioned, uh, we're, we're just seeing the beginnings of, of that work. And uh, I think the next five years are going to be very interesting in, in the world of human and robotics. Of course, the work that we're doing in um, digital biology so that we can understand the language of molecules and understand the language of cells and just as we understand the language of physics and the physical world, we'd like to understand the language of the human body and understand the language of biology. And so if we can learn that uh, and we can predict it, then all of a sudden uh, our ability to have a digital twin of the human is plausible. And so I'm very excited about that work. I love the work that we're doing in... Uh, climate science and be able to, from weather predictions, understand and predict the high resolution regional climates, the weather patterns uh, within a kilometer above your head, um, that we can somehow predict that with great accuracy. Uh, its implications is really quite profound. Uh, and so the, the number of things that we're working on is, is really cool. You know, we, we're, we're fortunate that uh, we've created this this instrument that that is a a time machine, and we need time machines in all of these areas that we just talked about, so that so that we can see the future, and if we could see the future and we can predict the future, then we have a better chance of making that future the best version of it, and and that's the reason why scientists want to predict the future. That's the reason why. That's the reason why we try to predict the future and everything that we try to design so that we, we can um, optimize for the best version. So if someone is watching this and maybe they came into this video knowing that NVIDIA is an incredibly important company, but not fully understanding why or how it might affect their life, and they're now hopefully better understanding a big shift that we've gone through over the last few decades in computing, this very exciting very sort of strange moment that we're in right now where we're sort of on the precipice of so many different things. If they would like to be able to look into the future a little bit, how would you advise them to prepare or to think about this moment that they're in personally with respect to how these tools are actually going to affect them? Well, 